Just to begin with, to set the, set the tone, Thomas Jefferson said that the Constitution has made no provision for holding foreign territory and still less for incorporating foreign nations into our union. We acquired, the United States acquired the Mexican session under the Treaty of Guadalupe, Guadalupe Hidalgo. That was foreign territory. They're holding foreign territory. They're holding lands in, con in conflict with Jefferson's own interpretation of the Constitution. What he's saying here is that the Constitution makes no provision for retaining federal territorial lands in federal ownership. The question of territories, the federal territories, was dismissed with a single clause in the Constitution, apparently applicable only to the territories then existing, giving Congress the power to govern and dispose of them. Okay, this is out of Downs versus Bidwell in 1901. What this is telling us, and the reason I put this up here, is to show that in order to interpret uh, uh, and, and uh, calculate what the federal mandate with respect to public lands is, we don't have to look at multiple clauses of the Constitution. We only have to look at one. All of the issues with respect to public lands and pre-statehood territorial lands derive from the property clause, Article 4, Section 3, Clause 2. Okay, so that's the only one we have to look at uh, according to the Supreme Court, and certainly that's true. Okay, Chris. Okay, Congress shall have the power to dispose of, okay, the, and that property clause, which you're probably familiar with, Article 4, Section 3, Clause 2, very important, so we'll read it. Congress shall have the power to dispose of and make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory or other property belonging to the United States. So there are two things here, power to dispose and make all needful rules and regulations, okay? Now, is the federal government, our, this is a rhetorical question for you to consider. Is the federal government the servant of the people or the master of the people? Obviously, since we're in a representative republic and the people are sovereign as a product of the American Revolution, the government is to be the servant and not the master, okay? So when the people wrote their constitution, wrote the supreme law, and gave certain powers to the federal government, the federal government received those powers, actually was created by the, the constitution, and received those powers, what, as a suggestion or as a mandate? Who's the master here? We gave it the power to dispose. I didn't realize you'd change the slide. <laughs> we gave it the power to dispose. The masters gave the servant the power to dispose. Bear that thought in mind, we'll, get, we'll come back to it. Okay, if we know the true meaning of the Constitutional Property Clause, we will also understand the purpose of the federal trust respecting public lands. And I'm just saying here that we only have to learn the history of that one clause, the true meaning of that one clause, and then we will know what the federal trust with respect to public lands is. To know the true meaning of the Property Clause, we must understand its historical context or the context in which it's written. The historical context, as far as our conversation here is concerned, begins with the resolution of Congress in 1780. Now this is gonna kind of uh, startle you. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, the, uh, in 1780, this was a circ this one's not gonna startle you. The next one's gonna startle you. <laughs> in 1780, the revolution was going bad for the Americans. Uh, the fortunes turned around shortly thereafter, but early in 1780, they were going badly. Uh, the states were arguing with each other over ownership of the former crown lands, the lands that had belonged to the king that hadn't been chartered to one of the colonies. Uh, so they were uh, contesting one another over uh, overlapping claims for these lands. Uh, the dispute threatened to break up the League of Friendship and Perpetual Union. Here they were battling the British and the Hessian troops and uh, they were fighting amongst themselves over who was going to acquire the land from their western border to the Mississippi. The Continental Congress recognized the need to diffuse that particular argument so that the states could concentrate on prosecuting the war. It was also an embarrassment to the League of Friendship. The British were saying, you guys aren't even working together amongst yourselves. Why don't you give up this messy issue of a, re of a revolution and come back into the, come into the uh, imperial government and we can work things out. So it was an embarrassment to the Continental Congress. They had to sort this thing out. Okay, Chris. The green here represents the crown lands that, they were, that the colonies were fighting over. There were seven of the original colonies, or we call them states now, that were contesting and ownership of this land here. 
So there was a lot at stake, and it did. In, uh, there was there was a belief that the once the war was over, that the states would go at war with one another over ownership of these lands. Uh, Virginia, as you know, was claiming all of the Northwest Territories. Uh, Georgia down here was claiming lands that later became Alabama and Mississippi. Uh, okay, Chris. Okay, the, or the origin of the federal territorial system. The resolution of Congress of 17, uh, September 6, 1780, uh, in Congress's effort to, to diffuse this contest amongst the states, it adopted this resolution of September 6, and it said, in summary, cede your land claims to Congress and that'll end it. Just give us the lands and then you won't have anything to fight over. And it puts an end to it. Well, the, there wasn't a great deal of receptivity to that offer. So just a month later, a little over a month later, October 10, 1780, they revised their proposal. The Continental Congress revised its proposal to the respective states and said, cede such lands as you see fit. We're not going to tell you how much to cede to us. Cede such lands as you see fit to the Continental Congress, and this is what we will do with them. That's something totally missing from the September 6th resolution. Here they said, if you give us the lands, this is what we're going to do. This is where the federal trust with respect to the public lands, the territorial lands and the, and the public lands begins. This is the absolute origin of it. So now we're going to go to that resolution and we'll go through it uh, as quickly as possible. This is the resolution or the pertinent part of it. You notice I've got numbers inserted in there. What we're going to do, we're going to look at each one of those sentences individually and very quickly because in there, as I say, the nugget, the origin of the federal trust. Okay, Chris. Okay, the first important line is, it's resolved that the unappropriated lands that may be ceded or relinquished to the United States by any particular states pursuant to the recommendation of September 6, uh, last, shall be granted and disposed of for the common benefit of the United States that shall be members of the Federal Union. Disposed of for the common benefit means that they will be sold and the money will be put to the, the, the Federal Treasury to pay for the cost of the war. Okay, Chris. Second, and the lands will be settled and formed into distinct Republican states. Okay, this is where the guarantee of Republican governance that's in, the, in, in Article 4 comes from. This is the origins of the guarantee of Republican governance. Okay, Chris. The third important, did we skip something there? Oh, oh yes, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, I wanted to segue here. It says they're going to admit distinct Republican states. I thought it would be important to show you what a state is. This is a Supreme Court decision of 1868 titled State of Texas versus White. In here, they define what a state is, and this, this is a real strong takeaway for you also. Uh, it ties in with everything you've been hearing this morning. In the Constitution, the term state most frequently expresses the combined idea, just notice, of three things, people, territory, and government. A state in the ordinary sense of the Constitution is a political community of free citizens occupying a territory of defined boundaries and organized under a government sanctioned and limited by a written constitution and established by the consent of the governed. In sum, this is undoubtedly the fundamental idea upon which Republican institutions of our own country are established. A state consists of three things, people, a defined territory, and their government over it. The people define, or the, the Congress defined the, the, the extent of territory, but then the people established the state. The people wrote their own constitution, elected their own legislators, formed their own government. That's the definition of Republican governance. Republican governance is defined as the ability to organize and administer your own government. And so be, be aware that states consist of three things. Most importantly, they consist of a geographic extent of territory. The, preamble to the Utah Enabling Act says all of that part of the United States now known as the territory of Utah may become the state of Utah as herein after provided. What is a state? A state is a combination of people and their government over that territory. Okay, just parenthetically I'll say, and most of you probably know, in Utah the legislature of Utah only legislates for 37 percent of the state. 63% of the state, it kind of varies depending on who you're talking to, 63, 67% of the state is still governed as federal territory by the federal government. By definition, being governed by the federal government, that land is no longer, it has never become the state of Utah because it's not governed by the state of Utah. It doesn't have all three of these qualities. It has, it doesn't, they don't allow people to live there. 
The government for it is not our government, the state, meaning the state government, it's the federal government. Therefore, these public lands don't meet this definition of a state. And so what we have is with Utah and all the other western states is islands of state governed territory, private held or state held, immersed within a sea of federal jurisdictional territory still. After hundreds, uh, over a hundred years of presumed statehood, we still have vast amounts of our state that have never been inaugurated as true states. Anyway, okay. Question? Uh, why, do, why do we have this problem? I think that'll get us away from what I'm trying to get to here. So let's proceed. Uh, the state of Utah, th oh, this is the preamble I just recited to you. Be it enacted, the House of Representatives, blah, 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 that one, the inhabitants of all that part of the area of the United States now constituting the territory of Utah, as that presently described, may become the state of Utah as here and after provided. And that as presently described is a longitudinal, latitudinal, meridian de definition that defines this <laughs> rectilinear figure that we think of as Utah. It said all of that will become the state of Utah. Well, here we are 120 some years later and 73% uh, of it, or 63% of it, excuse me, uh, is still federal jurisdictional territory. That's why Mr. Red and I, argue, and I think most of you would probably argue, that the promise of our Enabling Act, which is all of that will become the state of Utah, has never been fulfilled. It has been violated. We have a breach of compact, and it's actionable. And so, at least in our opinion, it's actionable. And so we argue that the state of Utah and all these other states ought to be suing the United States for fulfillment of the promise of their Enabling Act compacts with the United States. Okay, But here we're talking primarily about jurisdiction. Now let's get back into the resolution of the, uh, of the Continental Congress of 1780. Uh, which, the, speaking of those states, uh, those Republican states, which shall become members of the Federal Union have the same rights of sovereignty, freedom, and independence as the other states. That's the origins of the equal footing doctrine, if you're familiar with that. That each state which shall be so formed shall contain a suitable extent of territory not less than 100 nor more than 150 miles square or as near thereto as circumstances will admit. My understanding is that when they came out west, the lands were worth so much less that they figured more lands were necessary in order to support the essential public services of the state, and that's why these western states are so much larger, because the land was so much less valuable than the lands they were talking about at this time in 1780. The Northwest Territories, very verdant, well watered, lots of vegetation, uh, good farm ground, they didn't need much more land to, f to support the government and the people of a given state. But if you get out here, it's a different story. And that's why these states are so much larger and they didn't hew to this definition here of, of uh, the extent of a state. Okay, Chris. And that upon such session, remember now we're talking about Congress asking these land claiming states to cede their claims. Okay, and that upon such sessions being made by any state and approved by and accepted by Congress, the United States shall guarantee the remaining territory of the said states respectively. This is the claims clause where it says in Article 4 of the Constitution, nothing in this Constitution shall be so construed as to prejudice the claims of any particular state. And what are the claims that they're talking about there? They're obviously talking about the claim to territory. And what is Utah's claim to territory? Go back to the preamble. Our claim to territory is what Congress said we could have, which was all of that part of the United States now known as the territory of Utah as presently described. That's our claim. And so it's supposed to be our state, and yet 63% of it is still federal jurisdictional territory. Okay, and finally, that the said lands shall be granted and settled at such times and under such regulations as shall hereafter be agreed on by the United States and Congress assembled or any nine of them. Okay, there's two important things here, granted and settled. They acknowledge here that they intend and are obligated pursuant to this resolution to extinguish their title and dispose of the lands, granted and settled. Okay, and how are they going to do that? How are they going to carry out that granting and settling? They're going to do it under such regulations as Congress might intend or might adopt. So I often turn this back around and ask, ask my audience to think, uh, what is the purpose of the regulations of Congress under this resolution? What's the purpose of the resolution or the regulations of Congress under this resolution? The, the answer is 
the purpose of these regulations is to affect disposal, right? Okay, just turn it around. I want, you, I want to drive that point home. That is absolutely critical. What is the object, what is the purpose of the regulations of Congress with respect to the territorial lands that it might acquire? The purpose of those regulations is to carry out the granting and settling. Okay, keep that in mind, very important. Okay, Chris, thanks. Okay, that was 1780. They're still in the midst of the revolution. Question? It also says that any giant of them, that's any nine states. Yeah. At this particular time, there were, seven, there, there were 13 colonies, and so that's what they were talking about. I, uh, I don't think that pertains anymore. I don't think we could get nine states today to say we're going to dispose of the land. We have 50 states. Is that, is that your question? Right. Yeah, I, I don't think that pertains. What pertains is the obligation that Congress placed upon, the Continental Congress placed upon itself to extinguish its title and dispose of the lands. That's, that's the only point that's really critical here. Yes? Okay. Uh, yeah, I think it's arguable whether they are in effect because the uh, Article 6, the Debts and Engagements Clause, preserved intact all prior existing engagements. And so we would argue that the Articles of Confederation are still binding and viable except where they may conflict with a constitutional provision. So that, but that's another story. <laughs> okay. Uh, in 1780, when that resolution was passed, uh, some of the states began to cede their lands and respond to that, uh, but Congress was in the midst of the revolution. The revolution didn't end until, uh, what was it, 1782, uh, and so they didn't really have time to do much with the lands that they were receiving from the ceding states. And so after the revolution, they got around to business and they adopted the land ordinance of 1784. And in that land ordinance, they said, uh, written by Thomas Jefferson, by the way, uh, that they, the states, in no case shall interfere with the primary disposal of the soil by the United States in Congress assembled, nor with any ordinances and regulations which Congress may find necessary for securing the title in such soil to bona fide purchasers. Here again, Congress is acknowledging its obligation to dispose and is acknowledging also the means by which it will carry out the disposal. How? By adopting... Uh, Regulate ordinances and regulations. What's the purpose of the ordinances and regulations? What are they for? They are for carrying out the primary disposal. Okay, so they're repeating, just repeating what was said in the uh, resolution of 1780. Okay, Chris. What's the definition of bona fide purchaser? Why did they Legitimate, I would say. Okay, now we move forward to 1787. Okay, uh, this is the, uh, the summer of the Constitutional Convention, as you're probably well aware. The Constitutional Convention, I believe, convened in May in Philadelphia. Uh, the Continental Congress was meeting in New York uh, at the same time, just uh, 90 miles away. Okay, on uh, July 13th, the Continental Congress, over there 90 miles away from the Constitutional Convention, adopted the Northwest Ordinance, and with respect to the disposition of the uh, territorial lands, that ordinance says this. The legislatures of those districts or new states shall never interfere with the primary disposal of the soil by the United States in Congress assembled, nor with any regulations Congress may find necessary for securing title in such soil to bona fide purchasers. Notice the language is almost the same, and it tells us exactly what the regulations of Congress are for. Or this, in the case of the resolution, it says disposal under the regulations. Both, all three of those. Uh, our uh, prepositional phrases that say how the disposition is going to be done. It's going to be done according to regulation or ordinance. Okay, Chris. It's clear that the Continental Congress, which drafted the three historic documents above, that's the Resolution of 1780, the Land Ordinance of 1784, and the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, Okay, it's clear that the Continental Congress, which drafted the three historic documents above, intended that its rules and regulations respecting the territorial lands would be for a singular purpose, and that purpose is their disposal. Okay, Chris. Okay, now consider the text of the property clause. We already had it up there once. Uh, Congress shall have the power to dispose of and make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory or other property belonging to the United States. Okay, this clause was uh, uh, debated and adopted by the Continental Convention, uh, excuse me, Constitutional Convention on August 30th, 1787, just 48 days after the adoption of the Northwest Ordinance by the Continental Congress. 
given the, plain, the, given the text and plain intent of the resolution of 1780, the land ordinance of 1784, the Northwest Ordinance of July 13, 1780, that should be 1787, excuse me, uh, can it be reasonably argued that the delegated power to dispose up here in the clause, power to dispose, written into the property clause could actually include the power to not dispose? Is it possible that the framers sitting over there could say, hmm, we'll write in there that we're giving Congress the power to dispose, but we actually mean that they don't have to either? Is it possible that they could be saying that? Now go back to the rhetorical question I asked before. Is the federal government the servant of the people or is it the master? Is it the servant or the master? If Obviously, we're the sovereigns. We delegated power to it. If the federal government says, well, you gave us the power to dispose, but we're choosing not to do it, isn't that insurrection against the will of the people? It most certainly is. It most certainly is. One of the powers that was not delegated to the federal government is the power of free will to do as you wish. We gave the federal government a certain enumeration of powers with the full intent that those powers would be carry out, carried out as intended. This is one of them. Okay? All right. Okay, men do not use words to defeat their purposes. In other words, there were, there were uh, 55 men attended the, the, uh, continental, uh, the Constitutional Convention. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting turned around here. 55, uh, yeah, 55 men attended the con uh, Constitutional Convention. Out of those 55 men, 10 of them had been members of the Continental Congress in 1780 when that resolution was adopted. That's about 20%, 20% of the total uh, attendance of the Constitutional Convention. Do you think that those 10 men would have allowed for that granted power to dispose to actually mean not dispose when they participated in adoption of the resolution of October 10, 1780, which specifically obligated Congress to dispose? I don't think we can attribute to them that kind of duplicity. I don't think that's fair. I don't think it's just and it's certainly not right. Okay, so when we read the property clause that says Congress shall have the power to dispose, Congress being the servant of the people and not the master, what are they intended to do? That's a rhetorical question too. Okay, Chris. Uh, there should be one more somewhere. There wasn't. Uh, oh, shoot. Uh, I thought I, had, I did this kind of in haste. Uh, I, have, I had several quotes there that said, uh, in, in, in effect, that uh, what the Constitution dictates is to be done as intended. I have that in several Supreme Court cases, as well as uh, some congressmen uh, back in, in the day. And so it only stands to reason that if the Constitution delegates a power to the federal government, that power was intended to be carried out. Now, that doesn't mean that the federal government will carry out that power the way we would like it to. It's like immigration. They're given the power to adopt a uniform uh, rate, uh, uh, rule of regulation or, or immigration. Well, they're, they're handling immigration, but they're not doing a very good job of it. That's a political issue. But they still have to do it. Okay? Disposal. They have to do it. And uh, during the early part of the Western expansion during Manifest Destiny, that's what they did. They obeyed their mandate for disposition. And uh, 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 it was only later that they decided that, well, this isn't a mandate, this is a policy, and we can change the policy. And we've allowed them to change the, uh, to refer to it as a policy. We've incorporated the word policy into our own jargon. You heard it this morning. And the fact of the matter is that it's not a policy that they dispose. It's a policy only as to how they dispose, not whether they dispose. Okay. Now, uh, in uh, 1976, in June, how are we doing here? Yeah, in June of 1976, the Supreme Court issued its decision in the case uh, Kleppe versus New Mexico. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with that. Had to do with wild horses and burros. But in that case, uh, the Supreme Court said that the federal government has complete legislative jurisdiction, quote, without limitation on the public lands. I ask you another rhetorical question. You know that the federal government is a government created by the Constitution and was given only certain limited and enumerated powers, right? 
It's a government of limited powers. How is it that the Supreme Court can say that with respect to the public lands, the federal government is not a government of limited and enumerated powers, but rather is a government of complete power, quote, without limitation? How is it that that government under a constitution can become complete and unlimited? That's a tough question, but it's, uh, it's what the Supreme Court said. Okay, there, there's a reason for that, and it has to do with special maritime and territorial jurisdiction, which we don't really have time to get into. But I do want to get into one thing. Back it up to the property clause there, Chris, and then I'm going to segue back in, into yours. They found yeah. rights out there. Like, What's that? They found rights out there. Oh, well, yeah, it's out of... Like they did with Roe versus Wade. Right, out of whole cloth. Uh, if you can't... You can't go back? Oh, okay. You remember in the property clause it says, Congress shall have the power to dispose of and make all needful rules and regulations. Okay? The power to dispose is not a complete power without limitation, is it? That's a single power. So where must this power, this complete power, quote-unquote, without limitation, quote-unquote, where must that power come from? Where, what was the Supreme Court looking at when it came up with that interpretation of the property clause? It had to be looking at that part of the property clause that says, and make all needful rules and regulations. Okay? Where, rules and regulations are not legislation, if you think about it. Legislation is an act of a legislative body enacting a statute, and then the statute is enlivened. It's, it's a dead letter until rules and regulations are written. Rules and regulations are derivative of a statute. Okay? Has anyone challenged it? Has there been another case at the Supreme Court challenging that? No. The Kleppe case is standing now as, quote, good law, end quote. It needs to be, well, I think it can be overridden. Uh, or excuse me, circumvented. When the Supreme Court said that those words, well, they didn't say these are the words from which we derive the, the opinion that the federal government has complete and unlimited power, the words being make all needful rules and regulations. They didn't say that that's where they got that conclusion, but that's the only place it can come from. There's only 26 words in the property clause, and you only have two powers. You have one, the power to dispose, and two, to make all needful rules and regulations. So if they're going to have all this power that the Supreme Court has acknowledged that they have, it has to come from all needful rules and regulations. But the Supreme Court has said that that's a legislative power. The problem with that is rules and regulations are not a legislative power. Who makes rules and regulations? The executive branch. And what are those rules and regulations supposed to be for? For the disposition. And yet Congress, uh, excuse me, the Supreme Court has done two things. It's elevated needful rules and regulations to the stat status of legislation and vested that legislative power, which is inappropriate, with complete, uh, uh, w without limitation. That's the two things it's done. And we have not, we as states and, and the sovereigns in this country have not challenged that because we have not thought about the property clause and what the court did with it deeply enough. We've just accepted it. We've accepted that it's federal policy to dispose of the public lands. It's not policy. It was a mandate. They may do it badly. The policy would be adopting, for example, the Homestead Act or the mining law. Those are policies. It's how they're going to do it. That's discretionary. But whether they do it is not discretionary. So we have the federal, we have the, the, the Supreme Court vesting all this power in the federal government over our public lands. We have been totally, as, state, as, as citizens of our respective states, we've been totally disenfranchised from major portions of, the, of that territory, which was originally dedicated to our purposes by virtue of our respective State Enabling Act compacts. Those compacts have hence been violated, and we go back to what I said in, at the outset, that violation, in my estimation, and Mr. Rez's estimation, is actionable in law, and that's why we're urging the states to, if they can't get this resolved by legislative action in Congress, which some people are working on, then it needs to be a Supreme Court challenge suing for specific performance on our State Enabling Act compacts, suing for complete statehood, which has been denied us for well over 100 years. Question, Mr. Redd? Gotcha. What, what Mr. Redd is talking about, if, you will, if you'll go to the internet and pull up uh, James Madison's no, handwritten notes on the Constitutional Convention, you'll find that there were two members of the convention when they were debating what to do. They, there were some members of the Constitutional Convention that wanted to take this issue of the public land or the, the state 
the contested state land claims and turn it over to the, Supreme, the new Supreme Court that would be formed under the Constitution, let the court sort it out. And the, there were two members of the Constitutional Convention that said, no, uh, we, uh, we want to leave things in status quo. James Madison chimed in and said, if we turn it over to the Supreme Court, the federal interest will be preferred and that'll just irritate the states and it may break up the union. So we can't turn it over to the Supreme Court. That's what James Madison said. These other two members of the courts uh, or of the uh, Constitutional Convention said, we want to leave things in status quo. The status quo, as Mr. Redd has said, is the resolution of 1780, which required for, uh, provided for disposal, the land ordinance of 1784, which required disposal and acknowledged the obligation to dispose, and the Northwest Ordinance, which had been adopted a month before, 90 miles away in New York by the Continental Congress. That's the status quo, disposition. So immediately after these two members said they wanted to leave things in status quo with regard to what was written in the Constitution, a motion was made to adopt the, pro the property clause just as you've read it. And so that property clause, by virtue of Madison's notes, is just a reiteration of what had been said in the prior historic documents. The obligation to dispose is plain and simple for anybody that would read the historical record in, in our estimation. Yeah, if, if the states win either in Congress with a legislation that disposes of the lands or before the court, imagine what a blow that will be to the perception of federal supremacy in all matters. If we can, right, uh, you know, the, to, to have the court acknowledge or the Congress acknowledge that yes, the states are entitled to this, what other federal uh, presumptions to supreme power are going to fall, whether it's the Clean Water Act or the Endangered Species Act or whatever. This is a fight that we believe we can win. The law and the history is all on our side. They have no, as Jefferson said, no constitutional authority to retain foreign territory, foreign lands in federal ownership. Okay, Jefferson said that, he told us that, we need to hear it. We can win this, if we win this, when we win this, let me be more optimistic, when we win this, other provisions of federal uh, dominance over the states uh, may begin to fall, but we have to continue the fight. Let me turn this over to Chris because he's certainly entitled to speak. Chris is a great friend. Mr. Red and I operated uh, uh, kind of in a, in a shell uh, down in southeast Utah, wrote the book and really didn't have much uh, contact with the outside world, you might say. But through a sequence of events, uh, Chris learned of what we had done. He was inspired by it, and he handed it off to his colleagues in the legislature, and the rest is history. So Mr. Red and I have a very fond uh, feeling towards this man. He really has made it possible. He was the link between our research and what's happening out here today. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, I am humbled by that, and if you haven't gotten this book, I mean, it is a lifetime of work of Bill Howell and Bill Redd. Uh, I believe that someday Utah, and actually the entire United States, will owe a great uh, hand of appreciation to those two gentlemen. I, I just want to bring it back to the big picture for just one minute. Uh, you know, I actually belong to a religion that actually has scripture about how government should, should operate. And one of its premises in, in scripture is, is that no government can exist uh, without the free exercise of conscience, the right to own and control property, and the protection of life. And it's pretty interesting, that middle one, the right to own and control property. We all have different experiences that have brought us here to why this issue is so important. Uh, Mr. Howell and Mr. Redd, having been county commissioners, have seen the intrusion of the federal government. My experience came in 1992. I was, uh, I had just finished my master's in organization behavior at Brigham Young University. Didn't want to go to corporate America, and so I found a teaching job in the former Soviet Union. This was right when the Soviet Union was collapsing. And I will never forget asking my class one day, I asked them, naively, uh, how they enjoyed their new freedoms. Because, you know, in our mind, the Soviet Union had collapsed and they were free. And I had a 19-year-old student that spoke up uh, and immediately said, Chris, until I have the right to own my own home, my own business, and control it, I am not free. And I thought, here's a 19-year-old student that grew up in a communist system that understands the importance of property rights more than probably the majority of uh, Americans. Fast forward to about four years ago, uh, I was out in Avernal uh, when the Undersecretary of Interior came to talk about 
pulling the 77 leases that were pulled from the state of Utah. It cost the state of Utah $250 million to our general uh, fund, three quarters of a billion dollars to our school trust lands over 10 years. I saw people that were not free. I saw the anguish because their, their ability to provide for their, for their families were being threatened. That night I came home and there was a book in the mail. Uh, I got home at, at midnight. I spent the next two hours. It wasn't the full version. It was the 45 page, uh, the 45 page version from Mr. Howell and Mr. Red. And I immediately uh, believed that it was true. And I did. I passed it on to uh, Senator Mike Lee. Uh, Ken Ivory, who has taken it to a whole never le le level. But this is really what the issue is about. For me, it's not just about land. It is about our sovereignty, about our freedom. That we are, in many respects, as a state, not completely free. And until we do that, I, I believe, like uh, Bill said, that this is actually a key for states to gain their state sovereignty back. For the, me, when we passed legislation two years ago to challenge eminent domain, it, it had as much to do about state sovereignty as it did about uh, the lands. Because I believe that there can only be one sovereign. There can't be two sovereigns. It makes no sense to me. Either the, uh, the state is sovereign or the federal government is sovereign. Uh, and I believe, as I think most in this room, believe that the states are sovereign, that we gave certain powers to the federal government. But if we can get this case in court, uh, as, as Senator Mike Lee uh, says, there was a lot of goofy Supreme Court decisions in 1976, uh, the Cleffey one, uh, or in the 1970s. I believe that we need to get the right case in front of the Supreme Court again and challenge that because, again, it simply makes no, no sense to me. And the only way that we're going to rein this country back in is through the powers of the states. And so that's where uh, uh, you know, my interest has been. Uh, I'm, I am grateful for uh, uh, where Representative Ivory has taken it and the American Land, uh, Land Council have taken it to a different level. But I believe it's also important to remember that it's more than just the land. It is about uh, sovereignty. And that's what the, the, the purpose of this. And frankly, I think as you look at the history, FLIPMA, uh, actually was, uh, did a lot of bad things, but it was also a good thing in that it, sent, it changed pol federal policy to say that it, they were no longer going to dispose of. It gives you standing. I'm, I'm a developer by trade, and one of the worst things that you hate to see a city council do is to table something. Because as long as they keep tabling it, you don't have a cause of action. Well, I believe that FLIPMA got, gave us cause of action. And then we've had a number, but you look at the, the overextension of the federal government, and it is continuing. It's continuing with health care. It's continuing with, uh, I also do mortgages. In the mortgage industry, the federal government has taken it over. It's the way for us to push us back. I believe that this is a, a great time to be alive. It's a great time to be interest, uh, involved in the process. But I believe that this is absolutely key. And this can be the way for us to change that relationship, make us equal partners again, uh, or actually put us where we really should be with the federal government. And with that, uh, open to a question or two. What would be wrong with, as stated earlier today, acting like the state, get your sheriffs and remove the federal people and let them sue us? I, you know, I, I, that, that's, as you talk to legal experts, the difficulty is actually to get it. I, I thought it was easy to bring a case against the federal government. After six years, they can, they can do things all around. And th there is some advantage of actually doing what you're talking about. Is, and I know that's New Mexico's uh, situation, is they're going to they're gonna be the defendant. And there are certain advantages to that. Uh, there are also those certain advantages of being the plaintiff, is then you get to choose the issue that is specifically going to be m merited. But I think the problem is, is that we're afraid to go to court. The, you know, as, as much as I have a dislike for the, 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 the radical environmentalists, the one thing that they are very good at is they're not afraid of losing. They'll throw a whole bunch of cases against the wall and, and 99 will lose and one will stick and then they'll, they'll follow that one. We have to be willing to do that same thing. And that's what we did two years ago. We got a million dollars for the state budget uh, to actually, actually $3 million, to actually put in a fund where we were going to start litigating these things. And the, and the, the fact of the matter is it does, it, it does take money, and we haven't been willing to do that. And I think we have to actually, it's kind of time to put up or shut up. 
we need to allocate those resources uh, to actually have a, a court case. Jackie. Just the argument on the other side is, we don't want to waste money on lawyers. We need the money for our schools. They scream this and they plead and all this. And have they looked at how well the schools are performing? Yeah, see, and, th and this is the issue that we did, and we were able to actually bring on the, with, with the school issues. You look at the, the return for, for us to spend $3 million when we have trillions of dollars. If the, if, if the grand staircase were to have been sold and Utah would have gotten its 5% proceeds, according to the Utah Enabling Act, there's about $50 billion that we would have. Uh, we, we, would, we would able to, to, just on the interest alone, double our state school budget. So for me, it's... Uh, that message hasn't been gotten up. No, and, that, and actually we... we the low level don't want us to sue because of the cost. Right, and, and for me, the $3 million, uh, we, we spend more in, uh, you know, a little time, a little cleanups here and there, and you have to be willing to spend some money, but the return, uh, trillions of dollars, and again, I think the climate is, is as people start to see their budgets, whether it's their Social Security check, Medicaid, as that starts to decrease, I think there are people that are willing to say, hey, this is a potential uh, uh, revenue source. I was just in Azerbaijan uh, this last May. Azerbaijan is one of the former Soviet republics, poorest, poorest regions, but 20 years ago they found oil in the Caspian Sea. They broke off, fortunately, at the right time from the Soviet Union. And Azerbaijan, you wouldn't recognize. It's not like the rest of the former Soviet Union because of the natural resources. We have that ability. And whether it's you get some people motivated by greed uh, of having these potential dollars or the, 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 free, uh, the freedom that comes with not being dependent on the federal government, those are the issues that we use. Um, I, think, I think the time is over, but I'll stay around for a few minutes. I'd be happy to answer any questions, Do but I do appreciate it. One, Grant, I know, has been working on this issue. There's a long history of it. Uh, and, I, and I think it is. It's, it's a great time to move forward. I think it's important, though, we learn from lessons. You look at the Sagebrush Rebellion. And why did the Sagebrush Rebellion fail? Or I, I think it rose awareness. But there was a couple things that got in the way. We got a little bit of success, and we were willing to take that little success and then stop pushing the issue. The other is that we made it a Western lands issue. And I think as long as you make it a Western lands issue, you're going to lose politically. The issue is, it really is a state sovereignty issue. Uh, Virginia wants to drill off its coast in territorial waters, but the federal government won't let them. Uh, you had new, uh, new, uh, Louisiana that wanted to put up berms to protect their coastline from the oil spill, but the federal government wouldn't let them. And I think there's ways that when you talk about the state sovereignty, issue, you can get additional states. But now is the perfect time. I think there is a, a, a good time to move forward. But you've got to have the political will and be willing to stand up to the teachers union and say, yes, I think this $3 million is, is well spent here because here is the potential gain. Anyway, thank you very much for coming. I'll stay, we'll stay around. Uh, but again, I just want to thank Bill Howell and Bill Redd. Uh, thank you very much.